In this video, we're going to discuss galactic shapes and galactic evolution. And all of this is going to be based on this recent study that might have discovered something somewhat groundbreaking. Groundbreaking in a sense that it challenges our understanding of the universe and understanding of galactic shapes and evolution that was believed to be true for about 100 years. Something that early astronomers like Edwin Hubble were trying to resolve by figuring out why there are so many different shapes and different types of unusual galaxies out there, but why most of them seem to fall into similar categories. The principle that's now referred to as the Hubble sequence or Hubble's classification scheme. A kind of a tuning fork diagram showing us a connection between galactic shapes. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Today we're going to be discussing why this, something that the scientists believed for over a hundred years, might be actually incorrect. But I guess let's start with the basics. So in terms of galactic shapes, we obviously have galaxies like the Milky Way, which is considered to be the Bard Spiral Galaxy, and we have the famous M87, the galaxy that treated us to the first picture of a black hole ever, that's essentially a typical elliptical galaxy resembling a kind of a spherical object. And then we have galaxies like the Spindle Galaxy you see right here, that represents what's known as Lenticular Galaxy. These are very often galaxies similar to the Milky Way, they're relatively flat and disc-like, but do not contain spirals. And for the most part, these are the three main types of galaxies we see around us. Although naturally there are some exceptions as well. For example, we have these unusual ring galaxies that we've discussed in some of the previous videos. We also have irregular galaxies, normally not containing any shape whatsoever, and ultra-diffuse galaxies that usually contain almost no stars whatsoever, potentially enriched in dark matter. Not to mention that these spirals and elliptical galaxies have a bunch of subclassifications as well. But when Hubble originally saw this, he realized there's probably a connection. Maybe one type evolves into the other. He made an assumption that elliptical galaxies, the ones that contain no shape, eventually get stretched, becoming more disc-like, and then become S0 type, which is lenticular galaxies. He basically made a kind of a proposition that the shapes most likely turn into one another. And lenticular galaxies then become one of two main types of spiral galaxies, either galaxies with a lot of arms, or galaxies with very few arms. And we've obviously seen quite a few of these spiral galaxies all over the place. Here's NGC 1300. And so this was a pretty intriguing proposition, and quite a few scientists agreed with this, and it kind of made a lot of sense. But there was obviously very little proof to this, and most of this was just based on early analysis and earlier understanding of the universe. Either way though, the assumption here was that galaxies like the Milky Way are the eventual evolution of every galaxy in the universe. But what about galaxies after they collide? What do galaxies turn into then? For example, collision between Milky Way and the Andromeda is going to create something else. But what? And so unfortunately this initial proposition by Hubble, that based all of this on just visual observations of galactic shapes, did not entirely show us how galaxies really evolved, and specifically did not focus on something we cannot see very well. For example, things like dust. And so even though lenticular galaxies were initially considered to be some kind of a bridge between elliptical and spiral galaxies, turns out, according to this new study, they also come in different types. And so this new study by Alastair Graham discovers that many of them contain a lot of dust, many of them contain almost none, with a lot of this data collected by looking at infrared emissions by using Spitzer Space Telescope data. And through a direct comparison of central black hole mass with the overall mass of the galaxy, he eventually discovered that there are two main types for these galaxies, old and dust poor, or somewhat young and dust rich. In other words, combining all lenticular galaxies into one type was basically incorrect. There were now at least two subtypes for both of them, and most importantly, they seem to possess entirely different age. And so these dust-rich lenticular galaxies were now believed to be the result of a merger of spiral galaxies. And so once Milky Way and the Andromeda combine in one single galaxy in about 4 to 5 billion years from now, according to the study, they will most likely form something similar a dust-rich lenticular galaxy, implying that this fork should contain something else on the right, a different type of lenticular galaxies. And his reasoning is actually pretty solid. He noticed that a lot of spiral galaxies will often contain a somewhat small central region, usually spherical in shape, and obviously a disk containing a lot of arms and a lot of gas. And all dusty lenticular galaxies will have even larger spheroids on the inside with even bigger black holes, and once again, a lot of dust around them but also suggesting that the age here was always older. Whereas the dust-poor lenticular galaxies 
Once they collect and accrete a lot of gas from outside, including the hypothetical dark matter, this can eventually gravitationally disturb them, inducing a sudden formation of spiral arms, but also fueling star formation, creating a typical starburst galaxy that contains a large variety of starburst regions in most of the galactic arms. And so here the lenticular galaxies still create spiral galaxies, but they have to be dust poor and relatively young. But then the question is, what creates these lenticular galaxies? And also how do elliptical galaxies form as well? And according to the study, it's really the merger of two dusty lenticular galaxies, which were actually formed from two Milky Way-like galaxies, that then seems to completely erase their disks, creating an elliptical shaped galaxy. Or essentially implying that these types of galaxies are the result of collision of very specific types of lenticular galaxies. Once again extending this chain even more to the right. And so it's the elliptical galaxies that seem to be the final result, but lenticular galaxies very low in dust seem to be the progenitors of everything. Although I guess to be more exact, it's probably the irregular galaxies that come even before that. Irregular galaxies then form something a little bit bigger. With the main implication being that maybe at some point in the past, Milky Way galaxy was actually a dust poor lenticular galaxy that started to collide with other galaxies such as the famous Gaia Sausage galaxy and eventually acquired arms. And so this is maybe what the galaxy looked like 10 to 12 billion years ago. And intriguingly, this is what the galaxy might look like in about 7 to 8 billion years from now, once the Andromeda and the Milky Way galaxy finish their collision and become a single object. And so that final collision is going to destroy the spirals and create a large spheroid with a relatively large central black hole and a lot of dust surrounding a lenticular galaxy, not really an elliptical galaxy as it was previously assumed. And if future Nogdromeda galaxy collides with a similar galaxy somewhere nearby, it's then going to form an elliptical galaxy similar to M87. And it's the collision of elliptical galaxies that then start forming centers of galactic clusters with huge, really massive objects right in the middle. Some of the most massive galaxies ever discovered were all elliptical and were all extremely ancient. So once again, we start with a dust poor lenticular galaxy, which becomes a spiral galaxy that might collide with another spiral to produce a lenticular galaxy that's dust heavy. And the collision of these two types of galaxies will then result in a basic elliptical galaxy. And the further merger of elliptical galaxies produces some of the most massive galaxies in the entire universe. And in terms of typical age and distribution of gas, at the moment this actually makes total sense. It also explains why we have two different types of lenticular galaxies and provides something really important that we can search for in the early universe. If the study is correct, we actually should be looking for these dust poor lenticular galaxies as some of the first primordial galaxies that could even explain how everything formed in the early universe and how everything evolved afterwards. And so for all we know, the Sombrero galaxy that you see right here could be one of these ancient fossils. But naturally this is just the first study and just one scientist doing this, so we'll need more confirmations, more analysis and more data before all of this can be confirmed. And so until these future studies, a pretty intriguing study, a pretty intriguing explanation, but we'll see where all of this goes in the next few years. With new observations from the James Webb, it's going to become definitely a little bit more clear. Until then, check out previous videos in the description below. Thank you for watching. Subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow. And as always, bye-bye.